to still uh, come together and be in his presence. And I'll tell you, today is a real special treat because um, Dennis McNally, who is now a member of our body here, who's, he and uh, um, April moved down from Northern California, right? Is that where you guys were up there? Yeah. 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 Um, so I want to say a couple things real quick, and then we're going to have Dennis come. Um, first of all, it's, it's unfortunate, I think, that we're comfortable with uh, calling people pastor and introducing them as pastor, but you introduce them as apostle or prophet or evangelist, and it's, it seems a little strange, which it should not be, because every church, every, every body needs the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. So it is such a Amen. gift to have Dennis now in-house. Uh, but here's another thing that can happen. The, Jesus said this, that when you honor a prophet in the name of a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. What does that mean? That means when you receive someone in the office that Jesus has given them for the blessing to the body of Christ, and you honor that office, the anointing that is on that office comes on you. You get, you get the reward of the prophet. And so the reason I say that before we introduce him is because when we fly somebody in from out of town, it's like, oh, the man or the woman of God is coming in and the expectation level is high because they're flying them in. This is a special person. But when they are a member of your church, you can forget the anointing that they carry. It's called familiarity breeding contempt. Mm -hmm. Jesus said a prophet is not without honor except in his own home. Right? Dads, moms, right? Grandmas and grandpas, pastors. And so we got to be really careful not to discern one another according to the flesh, the Bible says, is our human state, but discern the gifts that God has given. Because the, a prophet, a genuine prophet, is about to come up here and preach the gospel to us. And as we honor Dennis, as he comes, the reward of the prophet is going to come upon you and I, and we're going to experience the power of God today. Amen? Amen. So let's welcome Dennis McNally. Come on. Well, it's an honor to be here and to, to preach, and um, isn't the Lord good? All the, all the time, the Lord's good. I'm going to speak a little bit on the presence of God, and uh, if we can turn the first uh, scripture, Acts 319. Uh, Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that there, so that there may come seasons of refreshing from where? The presence of the Lord. What we need in the church, of course, is the presence of the Lord. John talked about the fivefold ministry, and, and each different ministry connects you. The apostle connects you with the mission. The prophet connects you with the presence of God. The evangelist connects you with the lost. The pastor connects you with the body of Christ. And the teacher connects you with the Word of God. And so uh, today, I, I, you know, I'm going to put on the prophetic hat. I don't call myself a prophet. He, he, he does, but I, I don't. But I put on, I'm going to put on the prophetic hat because I want to talk about the presence of God and give you some keys concerning the presence of the Lord. It, real key is right here, repent. Well, we don't use that word in our English language, except for in the church. So when we think of repent, we go, oh, man, it's sin. And, you know. But the, the actual word repent means to change. Change of mind. If you look it up in the Greek, change of thinking. And how many know we need change? Amen? Amen. Now, some of this change could be bad change. You know, like our government is changing, and some of it is not good. How many know that? And, and so, the, so when we deal with repent, you know, we, we don't go and say, you know what, I'm getting a new job, so I'm going to repent and find a new job. Uh, you're going to what? No, I'm going to change my jobs. I'm going to change my, I'm going to repent with my underwear. I'm going to change my underwear. I'm going to change, you know, we don't, we don't speak like that. We don't, we, we don't use repent outside in the real world. But we do, we do use change. And the first thing it says is to change. Change your thinking. Change your thinking and turn again to God. The key isn't just changing, because you might change for, for worse. The change has to do with 
turning to the Lord. When, when John the Baptist preached, he said, repent for the kingdom. John the Baptist was saying, hey, change because the kingdom's coming. The kingdom's here. And so not only do we need to change, but we also need to turn. We need to be, uh, in the King James it says, be converted. We need to turn again. Repentance is not just something that we do once and when we get saved. Repentance is a state that we're in. In other words, we're constantly changing, constantly re- having our minds renewed in the presence of the Lord. God is getting greater, increase of his glory, increase of his presence. That's how it should be in the church. Unfortunately, we, in many ways, we see it going a different direction, which is, 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 is you know, it's heartbreaking to see what's happening with the church. I've been in ministry for 50 years, <clears throat> and I remember in the Jesus movement, I was saved out of the drugs and rock and you know all that stuff and 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 uh, man there was a the presence of God was so strong for many years there was movements and the rest well what what I believe is there's another one coming but there's got to be preparation for that movement and you just see the preparation for the presence of the Lord for refreshing we need refreshing for his presence but there's preparation for that what is the preparation? Repent and turn again. <laughs> change, change your thinking and turn again to the Lord. Let's look at the next verse. Do not show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to change. It's his kindness that brings about change. Now, sometimes his kindness doesn't come in the package we want, right? Sometimes his kindness can be some discipline, some irritation, some other things that come in that package. But we know that God's kindness is his moral character towards us. He's not against us. He's going to show us kindness. But the package sometimes is different to bring us to that place of repentance. So we 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 need to be aware of that. We need to be aware that God's, uh, God's good all the time. But sometimes the package doesn't look good because we need to change, right? And, and to, 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 to bring about change, sometimes it's irritating. God, God, uh, God brings irritation sometimes <laughs> to us. And um, an old mentor of mine, uh, Sam Sasser, he had revival in the Marshall Islands. It's the Micronesian Islands between Guam and, and Hawaii, and I've preached there a number of times. But <clears throat> he passed away in the 90s. But he said before the Holy Spirit can move in refreshing and, and his presence, he must move in irritation. And I go, huh, Holy Spirit moving in irritation? He says, yeah, we, he needs to shake us up irritate us in the place that we're in because we get complacent we we rely on what god's done in the past or what and and so god's has to bring irritation to us in order for us to to change you know um the kingdom of God in Matthew 13, I, I don't think I put the scripture up there, but in Matthew 13, it talks about the kingdom of God being a, a, a pearl of great price. And a man sells everything he's got to get the pearl. You know how a pearl's made? Anybody know how a pearl's made? Irritation. Huh? Irritation. <laughs> the clam and the oyster, a parasite gets in there or a, or a piece of sand, and all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's irritating to the, to the oyster, and it starts using its juices, whatever's in there, <laughs> and starts making that pearl. Sometimes it takes six months, three years, whatever, and then it comes out as a pearl of great price. That's what, what happens in our lives. Irritation comes in, but it, God produces the pearl. And, and what's happening in the church today, what's happening uh, when, when, when John asked me to preach, he says, just whatever God gives you, but whatever God, you know, at the end of the year, you kind of look back and go, what, what's God done? And then the beginning of the year, you go, what's God going to do? So I look back at the last year, two years, there's been a lot of irritation. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> huh? Yeah, yeah, I think so. 
yeah. Some of it is our own doing. Some of it's the devil. But some of it's God. God has allowed it. God has shaken the church to show us where we're at, where we're going, what we're doing. You know, there, there's more churches closing than are opening now. There was a survey done in 2019. There's more close. That was in 19. I don't know what it is now. I haven't looked at it. There's, there's an irritation happening for us to repent, for us to change, change our thinking, change our thinking about the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18, <clears throat> talks about transformation. Whenever, when, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, there it is, the repentance, we, we, we change, we turn to the Lord, the veil's taken away. All of a sudden our eyes are open to see the revelation, what God wants to do in our lives, in the lives of the church. Why? Because we turn to the Lord. He's the answer. <laughs> the presence of God's the answer. <laughs> it's that simple. In our own individual life, we turn, you know? And, and, and when we're in that state of repentance, in that state of changing, we go, Lord, I want to change. Next verse. Now, where the Spirit of the Lord is, <clears throat> there's what? Freedom, Freedom liberty. We begin to look to the Lord. He begins to change us. There's a liberty. And there's, there's freedom in God's presence. This is what God wants. God wants us to be free. Now, to get there sometimes is irritating. Because we're not free. God wants to break chains and, and, and bondages and things off our lives. So he irritates us. And we're, all of a sudden, we're, oh, God, help me. Lord, help me. I, Lord, we, we need you, Lord. And then there's freedom. Next verse. And we all with unveiled faces contemplate or behold the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So God, here's change coming as we turn to the Lord, unveiled faces as we behold him and we behold his glory. Glory means weight. You ever you know, CEO of a company, you go, hey, man, he carries a lot of weight around here. God carries a lot of weight around here. And, right? That's the gathering place. Hallelujah. <laughs> but it, but it, it speaks of God's attributes, his kindness, his forgiveness, and the rest. And as we behold him, God begins to change us. But if we don't turn to him, if we ignore him, which much of the church has done, you know, not you guys, but most all the other churches out there. <laughs> huh? I'm preaching to myself too. We need to change, and the way we do it is to turn. We've got to begin to call on His name again, Amen. and then name, we call on Your name, Jesus. Now. I've said all these scriptures, gone through them real fast, to get to the next one here. This is one I want to stay at for a while, because this is what I felt like the Lord <coughs> spoke to me. I, you know, I have, a, I have a lot of, like, sons in the Lord in different countries, because I've been traveling for many years and, and, and helping with churches, ordaining pastors and things like that. And, and a lot of them, the last couple of years, have asked me, what's God saying? What's God saying? And I go before the Lord, and I go, I don't know. You know, because you know, I have a prophetic ministry. And so they go, you know, I want to know what God's saying and the rest. And, um, but it, it, it was amazing. John had asked me to preach, and all of a sudden the Lord says, I'm, this is what I'm saying. You're the key. John, John the Beloved. The pastor of your church is the key. <laughs> Just talk to him. Everything would be fine. <laughs> that, that was a lying spirit. Not, you need to go to Jesus. <laughs> Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those that sold. What's happening today in the church? God's overturning things. He's overturning things in our own individual lives and the churches and the rest. You know, 
Because, because there's things happening in his temple, me, you, the church, that he doesn't like. This is God moving, irritating us. And he's overturning things in our lives. And that we can either turn to the Lord or go, <laughs> I think I'll change and go the other way, Lord. And a lot of the church, in America especially, this is where I lived, this is where I pastored for many years, We've run away. We go, we want your power, Lord. We want your liberty. We want your freedom. We don't like the way we are going to get there. We don't like the irritation. We don't like the, the, the change that you're bringing. You know, I want to do my own thing and still have your presence. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. We can't just go do our own thing and say, God, I want you too. It's not going to happen. It never has happened. You have to go, you have to turn to the Lord and go his way, and then freedom comes, and deliverance comes, and power comes. Not your own way. So the Lord, because he's kind, and he's merciful, and his kindness leads us to change, he'll come in and overturn some things in your life. That's what he's doing in the church today, worldwide, but especially here in America. <clears throat> got a lot of false prophets and you know my bible says believe not every spirit everybody says believe faith faith my bible says don't believe every spirit test them see if they're of the lord because there's a lot of false prophets going through america that aren't of god this is what the lord's doing he's overturning things in our lives and in the life of the church not to leave us there overturned. <laughs> What's the reason for it? Next verse. And it's written, he said to them, my house shall be called what? House of, house of prayer, but you have made it into the den of robbers. My house shall be called the house of prayer. Okay, one of the keys the Lord showed me. Not all the keys, but one of the keys is prayer. What I appreciate when I first came, you guys had pre-prayer back there, and there was a, you know, a few people back there, and all of a sudden, man, uh, one, one day I counted 20, 21 people back there. I go, oh, this is good, very good. So all of a sudden, you know, we didn't want to sit. There was times we didn't want to leave the pre-prayer, right? Yeah, even John was late, the beloved. John, the beloved, is always on, man, that guy. Oh, 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 oh. One time he looked and goes, man, I'm late. I said, good. And spoken like a good prophetic person. <laughs> Doesn't care about the sheep. Just, no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. So, the, so the, God's saying, listen, my house is a house of prayer. Get the priorities straight. Beloved John, Mark, me, get the priorities straight. This is the priority. My house, my temple. I mean, you, we've got programs, we've got things, and I'm not against any of them, but there's an essential program that we have to have in the church, and it's called prayer. It's called crying out to God. Yeah. Even Jesus cried with, with tears, with groanings. Jesus did that. How much more does the church need to? How much more do I need to? Say, God, your presence is what we need. We need to turn to you with prayer and groaning and crying. That's what it's going to take. You know, I, I, I had the privilege of working with the underground church in the early 90s when it was persecuted. Some of the pastors I worked with, they were thrown in prison. Some were, were, uh, were killed. They, they hide me out. I go into these meetings Vietnam. in Vietnam. And, and um, we sent a missionary there who had uh, ways into uh, one of the largest underground churches there. And um, he was arrested and banded from the country. They should have killed him. We, we didn't have any, any embassy back then. 
Now we have an embassy in Vietnam, but we didn't have one back then, so I had to go through Mexico and get a visa. <clears throat> so it's because he was arrested, he, called, he says, you're, you're my pastor, and you're the one that sent me here. you got to go now. And I go, I do? <laughs> and then the Lord says, yeah, you're responsible. So, so I, I, I remember there, there was many times where, where there was such a cry for the Lord with the persecution that came. The irritation, the persecution brought the cry, brought the prayer. So when they knew I had a prophetic gift, so, so all the evangelists of this large network, there was probably a hundred of them throughout the country, they all gathered in this upper room that was kind of hidden out in an apartment. And I walked in, they were all, jam- you know, they were all jammed in there. And I said, well, we, we want you to preach, and you want... You know, we want you to prophesy. I go, oh, okay, okay. When, when do we start? He says, well, we're going to pray first. All of a sudden, two hours later, <laughs> they're down on the ground, tears. Oh, our country, pray for the country, pray for the church. And school. I go, woo, persecution. We're, we're, we're following guys that were killed. You know that. And the, all the disciples, except for John, they couldn't, you know, they said they boiled him in oil. They couldn't kill him. That's who we're following. Mar- it's called martyrs. You shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the other most parts. You know what word witness means in the Greek? Martyr. You shall be martyrs. Oh, thank you, Lord. Just what I want to do. So I'm up there crying. I'm in the presence of God that are so strong because of the cry for God. It's something you don't forget because I go, God, this is what I want. This is how they get there. Do you want to pay the price with them? And, you know, I talked to different ones have been in prison 10 years. They don't have TB in Vietnam prison. You know, they work out in the jungle for 16 hours a day or they were in a little four by four they get one bowl of rice a day for years so after we're done crying out to the lord they said well we, you know we have a couple girls over here that need to get saved and i said you, you got unsaved people because they're all evangelists one of them brought a couple girls that needed to get saved so they went through through two hours of screaming crying out to god to get saved. And so they're there and they, they said, we want you to pray for her. I go, thank you. I appreciate that. So we go over there to pray for these young girls. They looked like they were 18 or so and, and they wanted to get saved. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. I can, you know, so, so um, he said, well, um, I used an interpreter and, and one of the evangelists is there and he looked at the girls and says, um, <clears throat> are you willing to lay down your life for Jesus? Are you willing to be persecuted? Are you willing to be thrown in prison? Are you willing to... And I, they kept going and going, and I went, I don't think I want to get saved. <laughs> I was going, I don't know if I can make that commitment. <laughs> but that was, that was the commitment. But the presence of God was there. Yeah. The presence of God was there. Because there was a cry. There was groaning and, and, and crying for God's presence. There was real change. That's what's coming here. The irritation's going to do it. The persecutions do. I've seen our country go down. We're pretty soon we're, we we kick God out of the out of the out of our schools and we kick God out of our, our government. We kick God out of every, every, you know. Pretty soon we're we're a communist country. I saw it 30 years ago going down. It's like a frog in the, you know, you boil it, you slowly boil it until the, until the pretty soon we, have, we obey the government, not God. Yeah. Oh, it's coming and it's here. It's here. A lot of times we don't see it, but it's here. I saw it 30 years ago. So after we led these two girls to the Lord after they said, yeah, we're ready, we're ready to be killed and persecuted. You know? And, um, and I, I prayed the sinner's prayer for them with them. And 
then we carried on. I prophesied over a number of them, and yeah, it was just, but there was a cry. There needs to be a cry in the American church again. There needs to be a cry at the gathering place and a groaning and crying in order for God to move. They, uh, they would go into villages and preach. These evangelists were giving, giving testimonies to me. They'd go into a village and preach. And, and, uh, in some of these villages, they spoke different languages, so they had interpreters. They're, they're tribal areas. And they had like a king and a queen and stuff in these tribes. And so they would go in, and in this one area, the, 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 the king was, was, um, was uh, crippled. He'd been crippled for many years. They went in and laid hands on him. Boom, he got totally healed instantly. And the whole tribe got saved. That's the kind of cry. I mean, there was testimony after testimony after testimony like that. So when I was thinking of the gathering place, I was thinking of that back room back there where we just came. We had a wonderful time of prayer. I mean, there was some really crying out to the Lord. You know what I mean? When, um, when I pastored a church, um, I made a prayer a priority. I wasn't much of a, a good pastor. I had other people pastor the people. I, just, I was kind of a prophetic preacher. And, um, but we had... Uh, Mar- uh, your, your guys used to send me a team when I used to have these conferences and anointed worship from the gathering place. This was years ago, what, 20 years ago? Maybe? 15, years ago. 15 years ago, you would come and, and um, we, we would jam 60 or 70 people in the back room. This was every service for, to, for one reason, to pray, to cry, to call out to the Lord. So I, I gather people in and go, if you want to prophesy in the church, you come to prayer. Yeah, you come to prayer if you want to prophesy. You want to be heard, you, you come to prayer. Prayer is important. My house shall be called the house of prayer. So I believe what God's saying, the gathering place, and not all of you can make it. I understand, but we started, what, 9.15, 9.20? In, 9.20 in the back room, we all get together, and we all begin to cry out for God. You know, we, we may all be late for the service. <laughs> I, I used to be back there with the 60 or 70, we would cry out and go, I don't think I want to go to service and I'm preaching that day, you know. <laughs> Why? Because my house, my house shall be called a house of prayer, a house of crying, a house of groaning, intercession. I'm losing my mic here. Next, next verse. There you go. What did Mary just say? She's a prophetic intercessor. She said, this is the result. Here's the result. We go, oh, we want the blind, and we want everybody healed, right? This is the, this is the result. I mean, God was moving among us very strongly, and, and, we, and 67 people crying out to the Lord. We had, interse- we had an intercessor's group. We had another prayer group. We, prayer was... was and, and, and this, this woman in our church, his, uh, his, uh, his son, her son was, was demon-possessed. He came in, he was, he, he was involved in witchcraft, drugs, homosexuality, and he was just a mess. But he was, there was a cry. So I took one of the elders with me, and we went to the, we had a warehouse. We went into the warehouse, because I knew it was, you know, was going to be wild. And we started casting demons out of them. And that we, that different voices came out. Ah, and, ah, and nine demons. The ninth demon said, I, I'm the strongest with different voice. And I'm going to kill him. And all of a sudden, I'm going to strangle him. And all of a sudden, he turned purple. And I thought to myself, man, if I don't get this demon out, how am I going to explain to the police how this guy died? I'm going to say a demon did it. Sure, sure. Let's go to jail. And I go, Lord. So I, I, I got desperate. And so, so did uh, the elder. And, we st- we, and he, he was free. 
the last demon came out and he was free. And then he became a disciple. And then he, he walked with the Lord. Why? Because there was power there. Yeah. What was the power from? Because Dennis is a great preacher? No, because of prayer. prayer. There was a prayer. There was, we were covered with prayer. We were crying. We were calling out in the name of the Lord. So there was power. And the blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he what? He healed them. He healed all of them. This is the preparation for power. This is the preparation for healing. This is the preparation, the presence of God. The presence of God that we need in our midst. And I'm not saying, you know, uh, you know the prophetic ministry is everything. It's one string on a guitar. Okay? Don't get, you know... Jerry's a great guitar player, but he doesn't play too well with one string. You know, he needs all of them. He needs all six. We need all the strings in the guitar. We need the pastor. We need the rest. This is a prophetic voice speaking to you. That's all. You judge whether it's accurate. God wants to change us. My friend Sam Sasser, who had revival in the Marshall Islands, they were in a prayer meeting, calling out, calling on the name of the Lord. They were sent there as <clears throat> missionaries. Well, actually, they were actually sent to Fiji, and they didn't go, so they, weren't, they went on their own to the Marshall Islands and, and <laughs> because God told them to go to the Marshall Islands. And God began to move. Eighty percent of the islands were saved. They had signs and wonders. One of the wonders was <laughs> they, they'd have 24-7 prayer out in this field in the island, and, and people would gather there 24-7, just crying out to the Lord, praying and crying. So they were baptizing thousands of people, thousands were, you know, were getting saved and the rest. So that field, people knew in the whole community to stay away from that field if they didn't want to get right with God. This is a wonder. You know, I'm not going to show it to you in the scripture. It's one of the signs and wonders. So when people would, would forget or whatever, and they weren't right with God, they would walk through the field, boom, the power of God would knock them over, and they start crying out to God. I don't understand. That's a wonder. All I know is it was fruit. <laughs> people were saved. The dead were raised. One of his elders. <laughs> See, we, we need this back in the church. One of his elders was doing a funeral. The guy had been dead for three days. And, and he was preaching away. And all of a sudden, he looked at the body and went, he picked it up, put it on his back. And he began to run around the church with this dead body. He began to run around. And all of a sudden, the dead body came to life. His eyes opened. Went, everybody freaked out, ran out of the church and came to life. Resurrection life. You shall raise the dead. You shall raise the dead. You shall heal the sick. You shall cast out devils. I want it back. We, we need it back. John, the beloved, we need it back. Obviously, we have people sick here. We have people sick. We need power. When the power of the Holy Ghost comes, God will move. We've seen it. We've seen it. We want it. We desire it. There's a, there, is there a price to pay? Yeah. Oh, Jesus paid it all. Yeah, he did. Jesus paid all. Yes, Jesus paid it all. Do we, do we, so we, do we sleep on the couch now that he paid it all? No. Did the early church, when, when Jesus paid it all, did the early church pray in the upper room? Or did they stay on the couch? If they stayed on the couch and didn't do anything... They wouldn't have never received power in the Holy Ghost. But because they were in the upper room and they were praying and crying out to the Lord where God told them to go, if, if, if five of them said, I'm not, I'm not going to pray in the upper room. I don't have to do this. God can meet me over here. He's on my present. He can go anywhere he wants. So I'll go home and lay on the couch. You think the power hit them? The power hit the 120 that were in the upper room crying out to the Lord. That's where the power was. God's everywhere, obviously. God is sovereign. He can move. He can do whatever he wants. But when the power of the Holy Spirit came, I'm just saying they were in the upper room praying. That's what the Bible says. 
all together in one accord, in one place, praying, and the Holy Ghost and the power of the Holy Ghost fell. Right? Now, the only way the Holy Ghost fell is because what Jesus did on the cross. Of course, it's finished. I'm not saying it's not finished. But we, like I, the last time I preached, I said, we got, we got to position ourselves. We've got to position ourselves in the house of prayer. And see God move. We need to see him move again. It doesn't take a lot of people. I don't care if there's just a handful of people. It only takes one John Wesley. One Spurgeon. One, one Charles Finney. I mean, it doesn't... One praying Hyde. And you know, we think, well, if we, if we can just get thousands of people in our church, we'll have revival. There's thousands of people in a lot of mega churches. There's no revival. There's not even a cry for God in those, a lot of places. But we got people. Look, we filled the pews. With what? With who? Disciples? Disciples? Disciples of Jesus Christ? We need disciples back. quiet in this place. <laughs> uh, is there a next verse? Yeah. When the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna! It means God save! God save to the son of David. They were indignant. The religious people don't like this type of revival. Next verse. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? Out of the lips of children and infants, the Lord has called forth praise. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, he's called forth praise to stop the mouth of the enemy. The woe. To stop the mouth of the enemy. Thank God for a place that we have praise and music and and. And, and it needs to increase. Amen? Where all of a sudden we get, oh, the alarm went off. That means my time is up. Almost. We, the alarm threw me off. <laughs> okay. Uh, let, me, let me just bring it to, the, to us as a church. I'm part of the gathering place. Uh, amen? So, so I believe us as a gathering place, if we can, let's start with the prayer room. If you can get here early, you know, I, I realize some people have children and rest. You know, I'm, I'm not here to condemn anybody. I'm just here to try to encourage people to, to go there so we can see the power of God move. And, and we've sensed it, um, uh, you know, talking to John and Mark, the pastors and Josh, we can sense the presence of the Lord increase in our midst. Uh, uh, let me tell you one of the keys why is because back there, there's 20 people crying out to the Lord. You know, it's like vapor that goes up and fills the clouds of heaven and the rain comes down. Amen. There's prayer going up. Rain comes down. Sure, go ahead. Some of you are sitting here thinking, um, that's not my personality. I'm not like that. And uh, for years, I've been, that's not my personality. I'm not like that. And I've never felt comfortable in the kind of prayer meetings that he's described. I always feel like I don't belong. Um, but... Desperate times, desperate measures. And um, in the last three months, four months, something's happened inside of me. I think it's desperate times and desperate measures. I see the things you see in the country, and it absolutely terrifies me. But here's the deal. 
we all have these personality types. Some of us are, are, int are intercessory extroverts, and others are intercessory introverts. I'm an intercessory introvert. But that doesn't disqualify you from engaging in this kind of prayer. Uh, you can be a conscientious observer. But here's what happens. And this is going to determine. See, I, I listen to this kind of passion, and it frightens me because I don't see it in myself. And I take it as condemnation that there's something ser seriously wrong with me because I'm not responding. Introverts become extroverts when the trouble gets high enough. When the water flood gets high enough in your life and bad enough, introverts become extroverts. They start crying out to God because there isn't anything left to do but give up. You gotta cry out to God. What else are you gonna do? And obtaining that passion for prayer is as a function, it is a function of what you were saying. How do we respond to persecution when it comes to our lives? As persecution comes, and it's coming in multiple forms for all of us, we can retreat into a ball and, and try to protect ourselves, and that just gets worse. Or we can run away and get mad at God, and that just gets worse. Or we can find ourselves being stirred to prayer, because it's the only thing that's going to work. And as we do that, we become open to a kind of prayer that we were never open to before. And as we come into a room of people that are praying that way, at first it kind of freaks us out. But the longer we're there, the more we sense his presence. What he's talking about is, is absolutely legit. There, there had been in the last month, five weeks, six weeks, a presence of God in those meetings that just completely undoes me. And I find myself praying with all of my heart. I'm screaming at the, at the ceiling. I'm getting passionate, which isn't me. But it is now, because it has to be. Because I'm not going to make it if that doesn't happen. The beauty of his presence is, man, I think I just kept saying in those meetings, Lord, would you please carry this into the meeting? Whatever's happening here, would you please carry it into the meeting? Because anyone that gets exposed to that kind of presence of God is affected by it. Your faith goes up. Your passion goes up. And you don't have to struggle to be one of those crazy Christians yelling at the ceiling. You find yourself engaging because God is in the place. And it's real. And it's legit. And it's not put on. And it's not posturing, and it's not fake. It's not learned behavior. It's a response to the presence of God. And there's nothing like it. Come and take a shot. The water's just fine, Lord. Come in. The water's warm. Okay, so we're going to engage in worship for a few minutes to apply what Dennis is saying. I want to say regarding the pre service prayer meeting, I have such a passion for experiencing the power of God in our body. We've had seasons where we've had miracles in our church where we have an x-ray from a doctor uh, showing the disease and then an x-ray from the doctor and the disease is gone and we need more of that. And so uh, before COVID, I was calling out to the Lord and I said, we have got to have more manifest power in our church. And he said, you need more prayer. And I said, how do I get more prayer in the gathering place? And he said, before church. And I said to him, that's a really bad idea. People don't even come on time to begin with. And now you want me to call them there for early, early for prayer. But, and then I said, all right, I'll do it. And about 10 minutes later, I get a phone call from a local pastor saying, hey, John, are you free for coffee this morning? And I said, well, that's weird. I actually am. And uh, so we, uh, I, I met him in Poway for a cup of coffee. And he said, you know what we're doing at my church? We're doing prayer before church. I was like, dude, God just told me that this morning. That's why I am so militant 
about being at back there at 920. I know you guys, some of you find me just militant. It's because we've got to have the power of God in our church. And the prayer quotient will be equal to the power quotient. And so I like everything being shut down at a certain time. And we go call out to God. And then we come in here and just explode. And so I couldn't have better advertising for prayer than what these two just did. But for right now, let's just all stand and let's just get up into worship again. And let's call upon the Spirit of God to come upon us. And we're not going to do this for very long. But let's let this be, as we're closing out 2021, let us say to the Lord, we want more of you in 2022. We need more of you in 2022. We want more of you in this house in 2022. So come on, let's... Let's end 2021, entering into 2022 together. I'm, I'm leaving here to go on a three-day prayer retreat, praying for you and praying for uh, this next year and what the Lord has. So pray for me over the next few days while I'm going to go alone for the next few days being a prayer retreat. And I also want to say it is so great having my 20-year-old daughter leading worship today. So let's worship. Come on. Spirit fall, Spirit fall, Holy Spirit fall, fall on me, sing Spirit fall, Spirit Like a mighty wind, like the fire again, come and breathe your breath on me. Like a mighty wind, like the fire again, come and breathe your breath on me. Like a mighty like a fire again, come and breathe your breath on me. Like a fire, like a fire again, come and breathe your breath on me. We just want to. The Gathering Place Church, we want to be a doing church, not just a listening church. So I want to challenge us as we continue singing this to take in the words and just revel in the presence of the Lord this morning. And we're going to take an opportunity to just cry out and pray. You can do it in your own space. We've got prayer warriors all over this room. If you want somebody to pray with you over something in particular, something that's on your mind this morning, something that's really challenging you, want to encourage you to cry out to the Lord. Take that opportunity this morning. Just get in his presence. We're not going to just be listeners. We're going to be doers this morning. Oh, come magnify the sun, Savior of the
Spirit, fall. We need more of you this morning. Spirit, fall. Fall. cry out, Spirit fall, Spirit fall, every voice in this room. We seek you harder today than maybe we did yesterday, Lord. We come running after you, Father. We step out of this space this morning, Lord. And we take your presence with us into our families and our homes and our workplaces and our interactions at the gas station, Father. We take that with us this morning. Let your presence be so thick on us that people can't help but be knocked over. Dennis was talking about change today and uh, 2022, 2021 is closing. If there's change that you know you need to make, make yourself, position yourself in the presence of God. I'm going to ask that you come up front here. I'm going to ask Dennis uh, lay hands on you and pray over you. If you want uh, him to pray over you, he may have a prophetic word for you as well. That is, I'm going to make it work today. So if there's change, and that word was for you, and you know there's change you need to make so that you can experience more of the presence of God, then just move out from where you are right now. Come on up front, Dennis. Come on up front in April. And you guys are ready to lay hands on people and pray against people. If you want these guys to lay hands on you and prop us over, you just go ahead and move where I can move.
Spirit call. Come on, oh Spirit call. Holy Spirit call. Spirit. 